It's been 70 years since the armistice in the Korean War. And today, many of the divisions continue and in fact have intensified mainly due to US intervention. A few years ago, the momentum towards peace was building up as North Korea and South Korea held multiple meetings. But ever since Yoon suk yeol became South Korea's president, things have taken a turn for the worse and the Ukraine war has not helped. Today in Daily Debrief, we'll be looking at recent news developments as well as a legacy of this bloody war. But before we go any further, please do hit that subscribe button so that you can watch more episodes of this show and our coverage from across the world. And now let's get started on this episode of Daily Debrief. Let's start with the latest news. Over the past few days, delegations from Russia and China visited North Korea on the 70th anniversary of the armistice of the Korean War. Now, there was a lot of buzz in the Western media about the missiles that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un displayed before Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. But this is more than just some military showmanship. Russia, North Korea and China are becoming increasing, increasingly close, also due to US involvement in the region. We are with us, Anish, for more on this. Anish, so, I mean, usually no, news about North Korea is always, you know, from a very militaristic perspective. It's about North Korea's missiles and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it would seem like the Russia-China-North Korea relationship is more than just about defense. So, of course, defense is an important part of it because of U.S. maneuvers. We'll come to that in the next question. But before that, maybe could you expand a bit on what is the nature of the relationship right now? Uh, the nature of the relationship uh, is pretty much uh, something of a continuation that we've seen uh, for a very long time since the Korean War, in fact. Uh, basically, these three have been uh, part of the, uh, uh, I mean, like we could say, an, uh, a de facto coalition that has resisted uh, imperialist designs in the region, especially the Korean Peninsula, and then, uh, like, and the fact that the involvement of China and Soviet Union as supporters of the uh, the DPRK and the communist forces uh, during the Korean War actually also kind of builds the foundation of it. So pretty much, they haven't moved. The three of them haven't really moved away from that or veered away from that uh, kind of foreign policy uh, framework. Uh, even after the Cold War, even after when we talk about uh, the Sumipola world that uh, supposedly existed uh, in the post Cold War era, uh, and even after the fall of the Soviet Union as well. So, at the current uh, scenario that we are seeing, uh, it's pretty much a reinforcement of the uh, of the uh, set of friendly relations that already exist. So the invitation uh, to the two countries, uh, the delegates of the two countries, uh, also indicates. Uh, a sort of reinforcement of that friendship because obviously, apart from the fact that they were involved in the Korean War as well, uh, as uh, uh, as supporters of the DPRK forces, uh, they are also the countries that have uh, kind of uh, protected uh, from the worst of the isolationist uh, policy that the US has been trying to in, uh, impose on uh, the North Korean people and that is something that uh, that will always be remembered obviously and this is something that uh, usually uh, is used as some kind of uh, a roundabout way to criticize or even attack uh, china and russia but at this at the current juncture that we see uh, with what's happening in east asia this is definitely uh, a sort of uh, i won't, i don't want to say doubling down but definitely a sort of uh, reinforcing that sort of friendship that it is not shakeable at this point in time. And it's not the same that we see the kind of coalition that is happening on the other side of the border. Right, Anish. Also, I think economically, the three countries also have quite a bit to offer, which is something that's not too much talked about as well. Definitely. Uh, I mean, like the fact that uh, China cannot be uh, avoid at, this, at the current point when you see uh, what happened with the trade wars and even the chip was and how the U.S. eventually and the U.S. side definitely had to cave in uh, significantly, primarily because A, these countries are, uh, uh, you know, the repositories of rare earth minerals, which will be necessary not just for chip production, but also for any kind of major technological development that we are looking uh, forward to 
uh, in this current in the current few decades. And uh, but on top of that, these are going to be the biggest manufacturers as well. Like China, especially, uh, is the biggest manufacturer. It is it is for not for nothing that it is called the uh, uh, the factory of the world because pretty much everything that we use and every especially every kind of technologically advanced kind of uh, uh, equipment or any kind of, uh, you know, electric cars, electric vehicle uh, advancements that we're seeing has to be manufactured in China at some point. And this, that uh, it cannot be isolated out of that uh, equation. It is not the Soviet Union that we're looking at, like the, uh, despite Soviet Union's greatness at this time when it uh, existed, it was, it, it kind of uh, kept itself out of international trade and international uh, production cycles. And that pretty much was also, uh, it, uh, you know, in, uh, in part uh, one of its undoing. Uh, but that is not something that you can uh, expect from China. It is a very well integrated globalized economy and it definitely is an important factor in deciding global supply chains at this point and whatever happens in China will obviously affect everybody. So this is something that is uh, very, uh, uh, you know, not focused upon very, uh, very much when we look at some kind of any kind of alarmist or any kind of uh, war hawkish uh, news headlines or even policy statements by different governments. And Anish, moving on to the other side, we know that uh, President Joe Biden has invited the heads of the Japanese and South Korean governments for a summit in Camp David, I believe, and I think it's on the August of 18th. And it seems like a follow-up to the earlier meetings that have taken place, for instance, the Washington Declaration. And it does definitely look like, you know, there are going, tensions are definitely going to ramp up further in the region from both sides at this rate. Yeah, I mean, like, it's a very uh, tragic situation because we're looking at, when we talk about, like, uh, as we've talked about in the show uh, earlier, uh, 70 years of armistice, and right now, instead of actually, uh, you know, de-escalating the situation, what we're looking at uh, are, you know, policy decisions and meetings and all sorts of, um, uh, you know, military alliances that is just escalating the situation to a point where, Talks may not be the first option at the moment. It is becoming a very serious situation at the, at the current point in time. We have already seen uh, like the uh, escalation happening very recently with the arrival of the nuclear subs uh, in South Korean ports, and obviously the uh, the response from the North Korean side by ballistic tests uh, and firings happening at the same time. Uh, and obviously, the Victory Day Parade was part of that in in a way that it was trying to show, uh, it was a show of strength on the part of the North Korea, showing that we have allies too, and we cannot be completely isolated from the world at this point in time. And so this is something that uh, the South Korean government definitely does not consider. Uh, obviously, we're looking at the UN administration being one of the most uh, provocative, one of the most war hawkish governments that South Korea has seen in recent times, even there have been uh, conservative governments in the past, but even some of them haven't gone this far in actually, uh, you know, trying to push all the envelope, push the red line uh, as far, as much as possible to actually provoke the other side, which actually has nuclear weapons to begin with. And uh, at this, uh, and uh, what you pointed out with the Washington Declaration, it is uh, quite interesting and quite important to note because uh, once uh, South Korea also becomes part of the nuclear umbrella, then we are looking at something far more serious where any kind of peace process will be impossible without the US uh, involvement and making giving US far more control over any kind of Korean resolution or peace process or unification, which is like a distant dream right now that things stand. So this is what things uh, stand at. Like uh, the August 18 summit will obviously be very military centric. And will obviously come like the focus. I, I believe would be to make a historic deal out of it because obviously that is what Camp David has been used in the past as well by uh, different presidents. So definitely Biden is looking at something historic or to give himself a, a mark in history that will be not erased. But what will it take? A shape, what kind of shape it will take is very uh, is going to define how things uh, function in a you know, erstwhile tension, of not tension free, but kind of like uh, not a place where escalations were uh, as easily possible as it is right now. Right, Anish, thank you so much for that analysis. It's quite striking because just a few years ago, despite the fact that Donald Trump was president, 
there seemed to be so much momentum, the Parmenjom declarations, Moon Jain's administration, all that. And all of that has been so drastically reversed just in a course of maybe a year or two. Very, uh, you know, like I said, very striking developments. And we'll be tracking, of course, the summit on the 18th of August. And we'll get back on this issue with you as well. Thank you so much for talking to us. And now we go for the historical picture. The Korean War was one of the opening salvos of the Cold War and had an impact not only on that region, but across the world. It's important to remember that the war never officially ended. Only an armistice has been signed. The pattern of the Korean War went on to be repeated in many countries across the world. To think through some of this, to think through why it was relevant and why it continues to be relevant, we have with us Prabir Purkhaya, sir. Prabir, we're taking a historical look right now at the Korean armistice. Say it's been 70 years. We'll come to some of the more recent phenomenon. But first, going back to that time, could you maybe take us through what was the significance of the Korean War itself in general? It kind of marked the beginning of the Cold War, of course. But at that time, what did it signify and the kind of forces that were ranged? You know, this is the first war which is fought post the Second World War. And it's the first clash, ideological as well as military, between what could be called the socialist world and the, at that, that time the capitalist world, led by the United States, of course. It started with what will happen in Korea. In fact, the South Korea, North Korea division, as we see today, was not there at that time. At that point of time, Korea had participated on the side of the essentially of the Japanese, certain sections over there. And those who had participated with the Japanese were the ones who were picked essentially by the United States to rule over Korea after the Second World War was over. And this was the genesis of the problems that took place. The certain sections which had been led by the time by Kim Il-sung, who led the resistance against the Japanese, they were not going to accept somebody who was a traitor to the Koreans, as they saw them, to be put over them. And Syngman Rhee, who was put over there, was not even a Korean in the sense that he was in Korea at the time. He was really imported from the United States to take over this, uh, this so-called regime, which was going to be put in place. And the army, which had been co-opted by the Americans, were, were, who were the ones who had sided with the Japanese. So this is the genesis of what the Korean War was. And of course, both sides fought the Korean War. Who would it be in that sense? Who would be Korea after Japan fell? And in that, the first, of course, the Americans, uh, the pro-American forces were pushed back. America entered the war directly at that point of time. And then started not only pushing back the uh, Koreans led by Kim Il-sung, but also at one point of time threatened to cross over into China. China had been warn warning them that if we cross the 38th parallel, which has become the de facto boundary at the moment, then we are going to enter the war. At that point of time, General MacArthur, who was the leader of the armed forces of the United States there, said, let the Chinese come, the slaughter will be great. We'll slaughter them. But as we know in history, the slaughter was not of the Chinese. Of course, they died in very large numbers also, but also the American troops were pushed back quite a bit from near the Chinese border to, or to the 38th parallel. Now, the interesting part of all of this is that when the, finally the armistice is declared, at that point, the Americans had bombed what is today North Korea in a way that is unimaginable. As their own generals deposing in the Congress said, not a single structure was standing in North Korea. They had flattened everything. But all that bombing still did not mean the military balance had shifted in the United States' favor. Of course, if it was only Koreans versus the forces that the Americans had gathered there, as well as the United States, yes. But once China entered, unlike what MacArthur had said, it, it, it really wasn't the way they thought it would go, and they were really pushed back. At that point of time, MacArthur threatened to use nuclear bombs. In fact, it was a, ultimately the US political power, President Truman, who decided that was a step too far, and it could precipitate a nuclear war between Soviet Union and the United States, because obviously Soviet Union was on China's side at that point. At that time, he pulled back General MacArthur 
and uh, said that ultimately it's the president's writ which has to run. Finally, when the 1953 armistice is declared at that point, it's also interesting that apart from the first Cold War, hot war battle that takes place, the threat of nuclear weapons being used takes place, also the emergence of non-alignment because at that point, India's role, it is only six years it has become independent, 47 to 53. Indian role becomes crucial because at that point, both the United States and the Soviet Union and China need somebody with an authority enough to be able to talk to both sides and decide how finally the military separation would take place, what would happen to the prisoners of war on both sides. So this is that history where actually India becomes first non-aligned power to play an important role in world history. That is one part of the Korean War. The other part of the Korean War, again, which is not well known, is that there was a Unit 731 of the Japanese which involved itself in bacteriological war and other horrific experiments on prisoners of war as well as on civilians. This is the Unit 731. In fact, the kind of experiments it conducted were on par with what would be called the Nazi experiments, which are so much talked about. Interestingly, this unit of the Japanese army, which was involved in the chemical and biological war, was co-opted by the United States wholesale, and they were not put on trial, as for instance, the Nazi scientists were, who collaborated with this kind of same experiments on the prisoners of war and against the Jewish population whom they had done all these experiments, and also on the Roma people. Right. These were the people on which these experiments had been done in Europe. But when it came to Japan, the Americans decided that the research results of what the Japanese had been done were of interest to them. They protected them, took them over. In fact, the, the international scientific community, which was at that time the peace movement, they set up a committee to go into the allegations of chemical and biological war in Korea. And their verdict was that yes, there were these experiments which took place and it is true that now the historical evidence, the archival evidence is public that the US did experiment using biological war and chemical war against the, the, the Chinese as well as the Korean people during that war. So I think there's a lot of history which is not known, which is still important. But I think the most two important issues were, are that it was the first clash between the Soviet, the post-Soviet Union, between socialist countries, in this case China and Korea, and the Americans and the, their supported Korean forces, the first military clash that took place, place, the possibility of nuclear weapons being used, which finally did not happen, and also the emergence of non-aligned movement in the world. So I think that is the backdrop with which we should see the Korean War today. Thank you so much, Prabir. I think those three points very relevant to today's world also. In some cases, we have been, I think the Korean region has been, is now the farthest from peace since it was at that point of time, very worrying for people across the world. Thank you so much for that overview. And that's all we have in this episode of Daily Debrief. We took a detailed look at the Korean War, 70 years of the armistice, its legacy, and also how some of those developments from 70 years ago are playing out today. And in fact, are a grave cause for concern. We'll be back with many more stories in future episodes of Daily Debrief. See you on Monday and hit that subscribe button.